Singularity. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Singularity One-on-One. Singularity One-on-One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I am the host with the show, that is, I am the man with the questions. Before we begin today, I would like to um, take a moment and thank uh, to all of those first-time users who are visiting or here with us today, and just uh, tell you guys that if you enjoy our show, you can simply go to singularityoneonone.com where you can see all the previous episodes with amazing guests such as uh, Dr. Stephen Wolfram, Peter Diamandis, Kevin Warwick, Aubrey de Grey, and at least 50 others. Uh, and for our traditional users, I would say thank you for all your ongoing support, uh, which, as always, you can express in one out of two ways. One, you can simply go to iTunes where um, you can write us a brief review uh, of our show. And two, you can click the donations page on singularityweblog.com or simply click the tip jar in the sidebar on the right hand of your screen uh, where you can donate and support our show. And of course, all those proceeds would go to improve both the quality and the quantity of this podcast. So with this out of the way, um, let me welcome our guest today, uh, who is Dr. Linda McDonald glenn Dr. Glenn is an American bioethicist, healthcare educator, lecturer, consultant, and an attorney at law. Her academic research encompasses the legal, ethical, and social impact of emerging technologies and the evolving notions of personhood. Dr. Glenn, welcome to Singularity One-on-One. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicola. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, I feel kind of funny when you call me doctor because I, I only have a Juris Doctorate uh, and I have a Master's of, uh, of Law, but traditionally uh, I'm, not, I'm not addressed as doctor. Uh, certainly you can call me Linda. <laughs> but, thank you. But, but isn't that the same, like, for example, a doctor in philosophy? It... I, you know, it's funny. I think academia might argue with that. <laughs> I, I think certainly certain academics might argue with that, but you certainly, if, if it makes you more comfortable, you can also say Professor Glenn. <laughs> okay, no, Linda. Linda is, is, is perfectly fine. Thank you, Linda. I really appreciate that. Um, so let me begin our interview with uh, the fact that I greatly um, underrepresented your personal biography and accomplishments. So let me ask you to see if you can do a better job of doing that yourself. If you were to present yourself in a few sentences, how would you do that? Oh, oh, that's a hard thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. But uh, uh, I'll see. I mean, there's a, there's a personal story about how I got into bioethics. And, you know, let me share that. Um, and and well, let me share that because I think that your viewers you know, enjoy hearing the story behind the story. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. <clears throat> well, I was a, a trial attorney and uh, in, in you know, previous life. And my uh, first husband was uh, John McDonald, and uh, I've kept his middle name. He passed away of leukemia in 1984. And what happened was uh, when he was in the hospital, well, we, we had met in law school, um, Jack and I, and we had met in law school, and, uh, you know, we took the, uh, he graduated a year ahead of me, and uh, at the, about shortly after I had passed the bar and started practicing, uh, he was diagnosed with uh, uh, acute myelogenous leukemia. Now, this is 1982 that this happened, so, you know, treatments are not nearly as advanced, and uh, but he did go into remission, and uh, things were looking promising for a while, but then he uh, lapsed out of remission, and it became, a, and it became rather evident after a couple of months of chemo that he wasn't going to get any better. And I asked his doctor if, you know, it was time to bring him home. 
and because there was this new thing called hospice uh, that had started in England and made its way over here. And the doctor looked at me and said, bring him home. You can't bring him home. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, he's not going to get any better at home. And I said, well, is he going to get any better here? And the uh, doctor said, well, at least we have a chance, but we're not giving up on him. And I, which made me feel like I was being a bad wife and somehow that I'd given up. And so um, he, he died in the hospital a few weeks later of sepsis. Um, and it was always one of my regrets that I couldn't bring him home. Um, I, I couldn't bring him home to be with his family, to be with his dog, to be in his own bed, you know, uh, and die comfortably. And um, so that was sort of my, one of my first introductions to paternalism. <laughs> And uh, then in one of those things that happens in life that I think sometimes is maybe more than coincidence, uh, a little bit, a couple of years later, about two, three years later, uh, when I was in private practice, uh, I had gone from the attorney general's office into private practice, a family came to me and said, we know that you know what it's like to lose your first husband. Could you help us. My wife is in a persistent vegetative state and she would like the feeding tube removed um, and she was in the state hospital. It was the uh, Marsha Gray case. Now, I, you can imagine that in a sense this was redemptive for me because I was able to help this family mm -hmm. in a way that I was not able to help my first husband. And um, uh, so I ended up doing Rhode Island's first right to die case. We took it to federal court under because she was in a state hospital, and we brought it under federal uh, uh, under a constitutional uh, violation of civil rights under Section 1983, uh, right of self determination, because she had made it very clear that she would not want to uh, live this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we won the case, and I, I continued to do bioethics. I mean, I continued to practice law, and I devoted about 10% of my caseload, which is one day every two weeks, you know, to doing pro bono bioethics cases. And I ended up doing, you know, helping people out with uh, in vitro fertilization cases, organ transplantation, um, you know, sort of, I, I sort of taught myself you know, uh, and and also with the help of a good friend, uh, Paul Armstrong, who was the judge, uh, who was the lawyer in the Karen Ann Quinlan case. He was a wonderful support. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after a few more years, I said, you know, life's too short uh, to be doing something I'm not enjoying doing except, you know, once every two weeks. <laughs> and uh, I... Uh, I had fortunately and, and fortunately remarried uh, to a wonderful guy uh, almost 25 years now. And it, I think yeah, it's coming up in 25 years. He was offered a job in Burlington, Vermont, mm -hmm. and there was this great program going on up at McGill. And so I got my, um, my LLM, my Master's of Law, in um, uh, McGill. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, since then, I've been, uh, when I was there, I had a chance to interact with some amazing minds and amazing people. And uh, I was, uh, it's when I first started reading about Ray Kurzweil and about, you know, Jay Hughes and Cyborg Citizen and, and uh, um, I was introduced to the singularity. And um, uh, since then, I've been teaching, I've been taught at the University of Vermont, mm -hmm. in Albany Medical Center, and you know, a few other places I've guest lectured. So that's kind of the history. Um, it's probably a little bit longer than you wanted, sorry. But. No, it was, it was perfect. It's a, it's a very moving personal story, and I really appreciate you sharing. Uh, I'm sure our viewers would appreciate it too. Uh, because it answers the, the, one of the first questions that I traditionally ask of all my guests, which is the story behind them, because I'm not only interested in what they do, but I'm even equally or maybe even more interested in why they do what they do, how they got to be doing what they, they're doing. And, and I think your story kind of 
answers all those questions. So it's fantastic. Oh, um, even though, I mean, it, it's fantastic from that point of view, but it's clearly a very personal, emotional and, and uh, hard story to hear. It, it is. It certainly is a motivating force. <laughs> yeah. To, uh, to not... Uh, to not have to see somebody, you know. But, but interestingly enough, it is stories like that that push us to 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 do things that we do. Because I mean, on a side, a little bit of a side note, per, perhaps. You know, my mom passed away from cancer when she was thirty-eight. Oh, I was thirteen. I yeah. was thirteen at the time, and um, my whole life took a sort of a direction, and uh, because of that sort of fundamental event. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I left home when I was probably 13 and a half less than 14 because then we started having trouble with my dad who started drinking and so on. So I wouldn't be here today. That's a, it's a horrible event that happened. And you would not have chosen to go through it. And, and yeah, yeah, I, well, I would never have, pick it. Yeah, but, but, have, but, but having been through it. Yeah, it, it led to a sequence of events which met, made me uh, leave Bulgaria come to Canada. Uh, I, I got fortunately to meet my wife. Uh, we're very happy now. So, so I mean, you know, it, it is events like that, which are obviously entirely out of our control that give us direction in life. And then hopefully in the end of it, something better comes out for it. So, uh, and I think both of those cases are um, examples of that. But let me move on and, and um, bring in the sort of the, the women uh, perspective here because you know I've been mercilessly criticized <laughs> by uh, my wife most notably but also by others such as uh, for example Natasha Vitamore but my wife always is the most merciless in saying that look go to your blog look at your interviewees men <laughs> men men one after another you don't have enough women on your show and my excuse always is the same it's like Listen, Julie, I, I do my best, but there's not enough women out there. So I'm just forced to choose and pick from what I have. And, and of course, people's availability. So right. my question to you is, what do you reply to an excuse like that? Well, you know, I, I, have, to, I, I have to sympathize a little bit because I don't think there are enough um, women. Well, I think that there is a reason that women are perhaps not um, yet all that interested and, um, in this. Now, I, I don't mind calling myself a singulatarian because I think that's, I, I like that idea. <laughs> um, I've had a little bit of an issue with the words transhuman because I feel like, I, I don't like the term transhumanist because I feel like it sets us separate and apart, mm -hmm. um, people separate and apart. And also it tends to focus on uh, one of the it tends to focus very much on autonomy and self autonomy. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to make a generalization here, and it's a generalization that obviously doesn't apply to every w woman. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, at least my observation has been that women tend to think more in terms of uh, social networks. They they tend to think more in terms of communitarianism. What impact is this going to have on my family? What impact is this going to have on my loved ones? Mm -hmm. um, and much of the, uh, at least in the past, and I'm so pleased Natasha has been uh, president, I hope she, and I, I'm, I hope she continues to, to play a leadership role. Um, I, I think it's, I think that the, the Humanity Plus movement, which I like the term of that, it's human plus, mm -hmm. humanity plus, uh, uh, needs to embrace and recognize that there is value uh, in a, a communitarian approach. Um, Ray Kurzweil himself is very concerned about these issues mm -hmm. and uh, he, he's very concerned about the impact upon society. Um, while as my observation has been in the past, some of the leaders have been focused on, this is my choice, my body, my, you know, this is what I get to do. This is what I want to do to be able to improve myself. And I, I think at least like from my perspective, 
that women ask the question, well, what's this going to do for everyone else? You know, it's not so much about me as it is about my community. And, and that, there's an aspect of feminist bioethics in there, too, which, you know, so, is something that uh, is all about relationships. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to see more women and more of a woman's influence, too. Uh, I, so, you, know, you know from reading my history that I was the editor-in-chief of the Women's Bioethics blog. You know, so which also you know sort of carried a, a heavy singularitarian theme uh, to it, but also a community theme. So uh, I'm I'm hoping maybe this interview, this video, will encourage women, <laughs> I, uh, you know, to become more involved and to uh, explore these issues because I, I I believe that the technologies are heading in such a way that they can have a tremendous positive impact on our environment. Yeah. Um, uh, never have we been more interconnected, uh, which is uh, an exciting thing to me. It's not, the, it, it's not the old wild west where, you know, we're all cowboys. <laughs> uh, it, it's about working together. It's about being part of a, a, a community and, and, and a group and trying to raise everyone up. Um, I think it was John Kennedy who said that when you know the tide comes in, all boats rise. <laughs> and uh, that's, that is one of the things that I would like to see emphasized in the Humanity Plus uh, movement. Yeah, I think that's one of the older parables actually in... Um coming from 17th or maybe 18th, uh, maybe 16th century capitalism, the original parables okay. about uh, capitalism and how when the tide rises, all boats are risen too. And so, but uh, let me get back to the meat of the matter here, uh, which is, uh, you've mentioned bioethics. So, and, and you've told us your very moving personal story of going from law into it. But so, let me get this right. Was your original starting interest in law or did you have a preceding interest into ethics before you got to do law and then you kind of returned to it? Well, uh, actually, uh, this is, uh, I, I really, my first love was actually science. I really wanted to uh, become a scientist, but I was extreme, I was very, very discouraged from it. And uh, this was, you know, this was in the, uh, it was very sad, it was in the late 60s and uh, the women's movement was just starting and my guidance counselor said to me, oh well, you could be a scientist, but you would never be able to get married and you would never be able to have children, uh, it would be a very lonely life. Wow. Well, can you imagine saying, <laughs> I mean, it was... I hope she lost her job or something. That was a he. Or um, him, okay. I thought, okay. That explains uh, it all. And I don't know. I don't know about it. I think he was very old-fashioned from the old country. And, um, well, I, I'm, I'm sure he's actually he's long since retired or passed on. Mm. But um, it was one of the things that uh, uh, unfortunately discouraged me. Now, when I went to college, I realized I had a knack for argument <laughs> and, for, and for seeing many different sides of many different sides of an argument. And so, going to law school was something that, uh, well, um, a lot of people encouraged me to go. And let me say this: I'm not sorry I went to law school. I'm glad I went to law school. It's a great, um, it, it, it's a great background to have. Mm -hmm. um, if I co somehow could have combined it with science, I think I would have preferred that. Mm -hmm. But uh, how I got into the ethics was actually in in law. I um, what happened was as as I'm sure your viewers realize and as you realize what's ethical is not always legal yes. and what's legal is not always ethical yes and um, I encountered a series of corruptions within the uh, within the judicial system 
in Rhode Island uh, that are a matter of public record uh, that made it hard for me to say, you know, do I want to continue to do this? Mm-hmm. Um, now, at least lawyer with lawyers, there is an oversight the committee, and we we have the the uh, uh, disciplinary council, mm-hmm. but. It was my encounters with, uh, often my encounters with other lawyers and uh, unfortunately with a few corrupt judges who uh, just made me say, oh, you know, I need to, I need to be able to do something else. Uh, I, uh, and so I had this interest in bioethics, but I've, but I had had also a long interest in ethics because of my experience Mm -hmm. Uh, in the law, and well, bioethics just felt like the perfect fit. I, I just, I, I, went, I did the one week intensive course at Georgetown, an introduction to bioethics, and I woke up every morning excited and saying, oh my gosh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And yeah. speaking of uh, this is what we're supposed to be doing, it, I also agree entirely with you because I think it's going to come more and more to the fore, not only in terms of ethical discourse, but also legal discourse, political discourse, personal discourse, collective public discourse, uh, maybe even religious and spiritual discourse, because all the changes that we're witnessing today in technology would have impact on all those spheres and realms of our lives. Oh, absolutely. And, And I think that, and I have to admit, I've been influenced by the writings of Eckhart Tolle, uh, who wrote uh, uh, a New Earth, you know, uh, awakening? To, I think I think it's awakening to your uh, life's purpose. But I really do see much of what is going on as a battle between um, the ego and uh, our true natures. Mm-hmm. So, so let me ask a, a very specific question here. Now, uh, we've been talking a little bit about women's rights and women's issues in the beginning of our conversation. Um, the, the human rights uh, struggle has been going on for relatively longer than the specific women's rights struggle. Uh, and the question arises then, given everything that's going on in technology, is it time to sort of put human, the, the concept of human rights in the history books and perhaps move on to uh, a new concept of what we should call perhaps intelligence rights or sentient rights? Sentience rights, I would prefer that. Uh, <clears throat> it's a good question. I think that certainly um, there are, I'm sure you've met individuals who consider themselves human exceptionalists. And uh, uh, in one sense, I am in agreement with them, in, but only in the sense that I think we have a special duty and responsibility to uh, other the other beings that we share this planet with, uh, because because we are at the top of the pyramid right now, and um, so I, that's one of the reasons I, I like the idea of humanity plus, mm-hmm. because it's. Um, I think that yes, at the very at the very least, we need human rights, and yes, I would like to see it evolve into sentient rights, mm-hmm. because, uh, as you may know, or have, from my from some of the things I've written, I, I, th- I believe there's three areas in which uh, traditional notions of, of personhood are evolving. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, one of them is uh, certainly right on point in the singularity, and uh, uh, that is, you know, with human-machine mergers. Mm-hmm. So, so before we get there, perhaps I should just ask you to spell it out a little bit more clearly for our viewers who, just like me, do not have a background in law, uh, and feel free to comment on it both from legal point of view and or ethical or bioethical point of view. So <clears throat> let's make the distinction and see how it goes. What do we mean when we say uh, that someone is a human right. and that someone is a person? Okay. Uh, well, how, what the are law the differences? Act- and, and <clears throat> sort of now, 
<clears throat> the law is a different. Uh, the law is a little bit different than the ethical viewpoint um, mm. uh, on this, or you could say that uh, the law informs the ethical viewpoint on this. And under under the law, under our current legal system in the United States, we have a dichotomy. You are either a person or you are property. Okay, and we actually don't have a definition a federal definition or a broad uh, definition of what it means to be human in the United States. Now, I think it was Louisiana who's attempted to define uh, human by saying, by defining uh, it as the species Homo sapiens from the moment of conception, but uh, that is a very problematic definition mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, you know, genetic variation uh, really would then exclude anybody who has a slight variation in their genes. What about, for example, the Homo floresiensis? Uh, we don't know uh, that were discovered in Java, in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. They certainly seemed human enough, as if they were humans. We don't know because they're, they're gone. Mm -hmm. But uh, really, would we want to say that they were somehow less than human? Um, that's a, a, a bit of a frightening thought. Uh, but back to the law. <clears throat> uh, so, so there's a lot of problems with that definition, and there's a reason that this has not spread. Yeah. Uh, this attempted uh, definition has not spread. So um, persons or property, okay? There's been a traditional dichotomy in the law. However, there is, there's a problem with that dichotomy and that... that it is not held up very well. I mean, for example, women, children, and slaves were once considered property. Yeah. And uh, it took, uh, it's taken more than 100 years, but since, um, gosh, since the Civil War, uh, there has been uh, um, a, uh, you know, this ongoing battle <laughs> about, uh, and and in and in other countries today, women are still considered property. Yeah. And there are still countries in the world where the women are not allowed to vote and so on, or that's right. take part in public life and or drive that's cars right. and it's or inherit property, own property. Right. So that's uh, you know that 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 is still an ongoing battle now here in the United States. Um, Fortunately, we've, we've moved past that, and uh, I mean, there is, uh, you know, I think certainly an argument to be made for discrimination, uh, but um, it, it just shows that the laws do change and evolve. Now, <clears throat> where I've observed that um, tradition, th there are three areas currently where traditional notions of personhood are being challenged. And rather than seeing it as a dichotomy, we're seeing it more as a, con uh, as a continuum. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> for example, uh, in the area of um, uh, reproductive rights and, and abortion, uh, certainly there have been attempts to try and define a person from um, the moment of conception and, you know, that certainly has uh, problems and issues. But right now, under the law, viability is the point at which uh, a fetus is uh, considered a person. Mm -hmm. Well, with technology the way it is and accelerating, <clears throat> how long will it be before you can be viable, viable within, you know, a few days of fertilization? Yeah. So that raises some interesting questions. You know, do we have a moral obligation to, you know, raise every embryo that's ever been created? <laughs> and and uh, right now the, the issue of rights and personhood of the fetus is sort of t entangled with the uh, issue of the, of the woman's body mm -hmm. and right, uh, right to control over your own body. Mm -hmm. But um, there has been progress made on an artificial womb. And that in and of itself, will uh, start to tease out the issue of when does this being begin to have moral and legal status. So, so that's one area. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's also been laws, like the Lacey-Peterson law, that has passed to recognize the 
personhood of, of fetuses, and certainly in uh, much of the uh, uh, right to life movement, there's a, a push to recognize uh, not only fetuses but uh, persons. And if there is anything that approaches a consensus in the United States, it is that a late term abortion is more morally problematic than an early term abortion. And, and I really do believe that that has a lot to do with the issue of sentience, the ability to feel pleasure or pain. Mm -hmm. So that's one area. The second area is in the issue of animal rights. <clears throat> and this is something that George Dvorsky and I have talked about quite a bit. Um, we have animal protection laws. And many of state laws are evolving to recognize that our companion animals are more than mere property that uh, they may not be persons, but they are certainly more than um, uh, mere property. I had a case in Rhode Island where uh, someone deliberately killed a woman's dog. Um, and although we tried to bring it to, uh, you know, to criminal, uh, criminal charges, uh, there was not enough evidence and proof of intent. And we went to, when we went to civil court, the insurance company... Uh, said, oh, what was it, a mutt? Uh, well, why don't we give you like 50 bucks and you can go replace it at the pound? Which I think most people would find pretty offensive, and certainly we did. And uh, fortunately, the state of Rhode Island had changed the law recently to uh, that, we, that you're no longer the owner of your companion animal, you're the guardian, which raises the bar which raises your obligations, and I believe which starts creating a separate category. Now, this is not just Rhode Island. This is happening in other states, too, where language is changing. Um, it's also one of the reasons that we have these animal protections law. Again, because sentience matters. Sentience matters. Uh, and then, then the third area, which is, uh, uh, is, is the human... Uh, the human machine um, merger, and uh, which is a fascinating area to me, and I, I think I, I sent you my case study yeah. to read a, a, ahead of time. That uh, as we begin to merge with mach mach with machines, especially as we move into nanotechnology, it's going to be harder and harder to distinguish between the human and the uh, the well the machine. It's mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's something Ray Kurzweil said, and actually a lot of people have been saying it, you know, I, I think, which is that it's not going to be us versus them, us versus the machines like in Terminator. We're going to be them because we're going to be incorporating more and more technology into our bodies. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, uh, and, and at first, you know, people might feel sort of a little bit, I don't know what the right word is, uh, reluctant or when you talk... Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. But this is one of the things that I've observed. And I really would love to see a study done on this somehow. Um, see if you can find some funding to design an empirical study. When you talk to people about nanotechnology... Right now, uh, there was a study that showed, oh, people are rather uncomfortable with nanotechnology. However, when, you, when they understand um, or when they are given an example of how nanotechnology uh, can save someone's life, for example, we're going to be using gold nanoparticles to help ablate your father's tumor um, you know, by uh, uh, you know, directing certain... Um, waves, you know, laser waves or whatever, and, and this will help destroy the tumor, people will see that it's, oh, it's wonderful for therapeutic purposes, and they will become more and more com comfortable with it. Medicine is the area which is the introduction for many of these new technologies. So <clears throat> it will be a gradual acceptance, but I think it will be a steady acceptance. Uh, that's that's the the very last is is the most permit, pertinent to to our audience and, and our conversation here perhaps. But let me just raise the possibility for a fourth one perhaps and see what oh. you think whether you agree or disagree. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so on the one hand, we have the man, mer uh, the man machine merger that's ongoing and that would get deeper and deeper as we move on further in time right. and technologies get better. But also, correct me if I'm wrong, if I understand it properly, from a legal point of view, corporations in the United States are oh. legal persons. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I didn't explain that so, earlier. So, but, so if, but that's not my point. My point is if corporations can be legal persons, Cannot other sentient beings, such as, for example, complete, total, distinct artificial intelligences, be or become persons also? And, and there can be many examples. I mean, just one potential early example of that could be, for example, Watson. Mm. Watson uh, just uh, defeated Ken Jennings, who was uh, the, the right. most... Uh, uh, glorified Jeopardy ever champion of the history of the game. Uh, and, and of course, there would be others. I mean, just yesterday I posted a, a, an, a short news article on singularityweblog.com about uh, a, a machine called Dome. And it is a, a machine that will be created by IBM and Astron to be an exascale computer for the um, square kilometer array radio telescope. And exascale computer literally means that uh, the computer would be able to process 10 to the 18th computations per second. Now, current estimates of the human brain say that, you know, our computational limits are about 10 to the 16th or so. And therefore, this computer would be at least two orders of magnitude in terms of hardware, uh, more powerful than a human brain. Now. Provided that also, of course, we do need to get the software right, but <laughs> yes. perhaps we could. And, yeah. and, and, and if we would, then why wouldn't a machine be a person if a corporation could be one? Well, now that's, that's a really good question, uh, Nicola. Uh, how does one, how did corporations become persons? How did ships become persons? What happened was the Supreme Court of the United States uh, created their called um, legal fictions and uh, decided for whatever reason, uh, the, the feeling is the, the, that it was for economic reasons in the 1800s that the Supreme Court recognized corporations of pers as persons. Uh, I can't remember the name of the case exactly, but uh, basically um, the Supreme Court gave very little explanation and said, oh, well, of course, uh, you know, corporations are, are legal persons too. Now, <clears throat> uh, now, this is what would be called a juridical person because corporations don't have the same rights as individuals. They have limited rights. Um, and uh, you might say limited responsibilities too. So... Um, it's uh, that. So, how does one become a person? Basically, either one of three ways in the law. Okay, uh, is is through uh, declaration, <laughs> say of the the president. Okay, the other way is through legislation. The recognition of the legislature would have to draft a law saying that we recognize, you know, these, um, uh, you know, this the sentient being to be a legal person. And the third area is judicial, uh, judicial recognition. And judicial recognition is um, perhaps one of the areas where there is um, more room. Um, I'm not sure what the, let, let me just think about how to phrase this. The judiciary has the capability to recognize evolutions in the law. Mm -hmm. And, well, hey, the Supreme Court was the one that recognized, you know, said that corporations are persons. You know, there is, um, um, there is really no reason uh, that, you know, we, we couldn't see that happen within the courts. In fact, there's the wonderful trial of Bina 48 in um, which if you Google the Bina 48 trial on, on Google, you would find, I think, the video. Oh, I don't know if it, I'm not sure if it's online, but it was a mock trial to uh, declare uh, an, an artificial intelligence uh, a, a legal person because she did not want to be dismantled. 
and, and lose her um, awareness. Okay. So, so we have a system in place for recognition um, of a person, and um, that that would it would be either one of those uh, three ways. So, oh, but to get to there's another aspect of I think of this which is very important, and that is. Um, you know, how does one measure intelligence? I mean, is intelligence really the only quality we want to use? Mm -hmm. I said before, uh, sentience matters. I'll say it again. Sentience matters. The ability to feel pleasure and pain. Um, uh, was a brilliant uh, engineer, Bob Robert Friedas, had proposed something called the sentience quotient a while ago, mm -hmm. uh, which measured uh, compu computation ability and intelligence. But intelligence is something that has really been very hard for us to, to define because there are so many different types of intelligence. There's not just computational ability. There's not just, uh, or the ability to retain information. Uh, there's social intelligence and there's emotional intelligence and there is musical intelligence and uh, logical intelligence and, oh my goodness, um, I, I, I forget which scholar which um, suggested that we have at least eight different types of intelligence um, because uh, a, a, a computer may be able to, well, compute things, but can it interact with us? And can it, you know, can it experience uh, pleasure or pain? Yeah, and and Lisa, j just to uh, to let you know, I'm I'm experiencing some um, loss of feedback here, so I know that everything you say is being recorded because I can see it visually on the graph here, but I actually didn't hear much of the last five or ten minutes on my headphones. So with the risk of of, of repeating something, uh, let me ask you this though. So in that uh, scale of measuring or assessing intelligence. Is there a place for the Turing test or a, another similar test which legally though, I mean legally would have implications towards the recognizing of either Watson or Dome or for example Ray Kurzweil's bot Ramona eventually which he intends to, to be one of perhaps the first that passes the Turing test. So is there an implication of the Turing, Turing test legally speaking? You know in, uh, in the law we, uh, we don't talk about autonomy, we talk about competence. And the law has not yet recognized anything quite like the Turing test. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, as, as I mentioned, all humans are persons, but not all persons are humans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do we have any such standard? No, no. Um, it, it's um, there. There is nothing in the law, and and this I, I need to um, just make clear that to a large extent, what consider what's considered a person is normative, as opposed, as opposed to legal. Absolutely, and always. I mean, we we cannot necessarily place a list of characteristics yeah. and say oh, this is a this is clearly a person. Um, you can hear my doggy barking in the background. She's at the bottom of the stairs, and she wants to come up. I'm sorry, where, where did we leave off? Uh, yeah, we were talking about um, any potential legal implications of a Turing test or another test which would legally uh, move an entity towards its recognized, its being recognized as a sentient being or as a person. Not yet. Not, we do not have anything like that yet. And, and partly because it is, uh, uh, you know, such a normative thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you try, and, and, and difficult. I mean, in feminist bioethics, we uh, tend to place an emphasis on the relationship. So if a woman is pregnant and considers her, her uh, self to, you know, have a baby from the moment she realizes that she's pregnant, that's what's important to her. And should be, you know, valued and honored, you know. Um, but to try and, uh, um, you know, and 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 yet 
you know, in, in past uh, history, uh, there have been um, uh, individuals who felt like, well, you know, in the first stages of pregnancy, it's very much uh, more like uh, a vegetable or a vegetative. Um, uh, you know, so a lot of that, you know, plays a role in, um, uh, you know, determining the relationship. Uh, the same is true of, has been true of, of animals and uh, relationship. I mean, there are individuals who say, okay, livestock is livestock and mere property, um, but people who have companion animals recognize that they have a special status in our lives. Yeah. So, and when it comes to machines and human-machine mergers, I think it's just going to, ta I think it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. I think what's going to happen is that uh, people are going to recognize, you know, as we merge more and more with machines, that it's going to be, become harder and harder to be able to uh, make a distinction. Um, and the Turing test is such, a, is such a fascinating test because part of the Turing test has got to be, do you experience pleasure or pain? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's mainly about, uh, not exactly the experience, but about right. perhaps faking that you have the experience and answering in a way in which it, it is perceived by your human interlocutor that you do have it, whereas right. you might not necessarily have it. And that's actually one of the biases that, uh, David Ferrucci brought to, um, to question, um, David Ferrucci is, is, is the, the team leader behind IBM's uh, Watson, which mm -hmm. I interviewed, who, um, whom I interviewed a couple of weeks ago. And his thing was like, well, for me, it's not so strange or, or, or fascinating that computers can play chess and can do all those other things. It's, it's more interesting and fascinating that humans can actually do them. And, and also for him, it wouldn't be so interesting uh, to do a Turing test because Turing tests would necessarily, in his opinion, bring down rather than up the capabilities of such a, of such a machine in order for it to be able to fake uh, our own human uh, biases and flaws and, and uh, you know, inefficiencies so that, you know, it, it portrays itself as another human. Whereas, you know, a, a really smart AI would never do the things that that uh, that, 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 that an true. average human have, would do. Have you seen Have you seen the movie The Singularity Is Near? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Oh, you know. Yeah. So Ramona Ramona does a, a beautiful job of of displaying that, of displaying that, uh, of passing the Turing test, but only by acting dumb. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm losing the sound here, so so I apologize if if we're a bit disjointed. But but I know everything is recorded, so so no worries there. Okay. Uh, so um, so what do we do then? Should should we be sort of reactive and wait until an entity puts forward a claim in court uh, that it, it it requires or is 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 applying for, as it will, uh, either person rights or outright human rights? or sentient rights, as we call them, or should we have a test which precedes that and, and sort of try to apply it uh, uh, and create it ahead of time so that it's applicable? What's the best approach? Well, again, because I think the whole notion of, of person is, is normative, I, I think it is important that, first of all, that we continue these discussions and, you know, that we continue doing things like, uh, you know, having the show which you do, Nicola, and, and, and informing people. Um, because I believe that certain tests, well, tests will arise or certain relationships will arise that um, will make us say, oh, this is more than mere, a mere, a, a mere machine or a mere piece of property, but the important thing is to um, the important thing is to um, uh, have the discussion and the dialogue keep going. <laughs> which is which is one of the reasons, or 
one of the better re reasons that we are talking about this today. And of course, those are very big, very profound, very deep notions that we would not be resolving today. But right. at least if we are able to bring in the issues forward into the public sphere so that all kinds of people and parties get engaged in those fundamental discussions, then I believe we would be a step closer. Right. Um, so, Linda, we've been talking for a good 50 minutes so far, and perhaps it's time to, to bring yeah. an end to our interview. Um, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So, uh, let me ask you the two questions that I always ask of my guests on the show here. And the second last is, is this. Where can people who are interested in what you do um, and, and your work in general go and find out more about it? Oh, boy. Um, I... I have to say that uh, the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology is uh, one of the group, is, uh, I'm, I'm a senior fellow at that group. Uh, we certainly explore those issues and um, you know, try and write papers and present as much as we can. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, I certainly see the uh, Singularity University uh, doing that. But I have to say that the Singularity University is more focused on the technology and moving forward in the technology and doesn't always address, uh, doesn't always address the ethics of the issue. Um, I'd like to see, you know, some um, uh, more court ethics courses incorporated, um, you know, into the, the curriculum uh, there. And uh, I've been in discussions with uh, the folks there um, about that. And, uh, but the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology is probably one of the, uh, the best, I think, resources, uh, the individuals. Now, uh, my, I have my own website, ethicsconsult.com, mm -hmm. too. Uh, but that's kind of, that, and, and that uh, is more of a private consulting business. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I have to, to say, I, I again missed a little bit, uh, but um, I agree entirely with you if there were any criticism that there is not enough bioethics and ethics in general at Singularity University, because that's one of the criticisms that I leveled when I was there. Mm -hmm. And I love the place. I love the people. It's, it's fantastic. But uh, it has a bit more of an entrepreneurial sort of a startup kind of mentality, which is fantastic, it's phenomenal, but I think it would also benefit if it has uh, a little bit more of ethics or, and, and perhaps bioethics in particular yeah. in order to um, sort of illuminate the, the discourse there. Um, and then yes. let's move on to the last question, which is perhaps one of the most important ones, um, and that is, do you have a single message or perhaps the most important point that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from this interview with you today? Aside from sentience matters, okay, <laughs> uh, my, yes, I would like to say, I, I would like, the one message that I would like to uh, send or have your viewers uh, um, understand is that, uh, the notion, notions of personhood are evolving and that uh, it is something that we should make sure that we uh, embrace and uplift, that we are not going to, for example, be creating uh, a slave race, that uh, we, uh, that it is humanity plus. The, the message is, okay, that we are all interconnected and that our actions have an impact on others and on the biosphere and uh, that we need to consider that. We need to consider that in all of our actions and be good stewards. That's it. We're, inter we're all interconnected. We need to be good stewards. Linda McDonald Glenn, thank you very much for being on our show here today. Nicola, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, to all of our listeners out there too and viewers, thank you very much uh, for watching the show. Once again, I just want to remind you guys, if you enjoy the show, feel free to express your support in one of two ways. Number one, 
Go on iTunes and please write out a favorable review. That would help us enormously in spreading the word for the show and make it better. And number two, feel free to uh, donate anything that uh, uh, could make uh, this show better. Yeah.